So okay. we, we're continuing our sustainable analytics conversation yeah. today. It's a good topic. I've heard yeah. from I've heard from a few people that have listened to pre, the previous episode that it really and and we we we've heard this from clients as well. It just is a topic that really is resonating with people. Yeah. What What are some of the things you heard um, as far as the previous episode goes? Where we just discussed the topic at a very broad level. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest in wanting to know more, but but generally the feedback has been uh, this feels like a breath of fresh air. <laughs> you know. Interesting. Okay. You know, because we become so, it's almost like uh, we're living in an episode of Hoarders. You know, mm -hmm. that's what it feels like. Like just so much and it's just so draining that the thought of cleaning up and just simplifying, just like, it feels like that weight has been lifted from, from your shoulders. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's people are, that that kind of concept of it just being refreshing seems to be resonating with people. Yeah. And, and I like how you bring up the, the idea of, of hoarders because we, we, and we've talked about it on the show before the idea of digital hoarders, um, people that, you know, in, in our particular space, you know, they, they want to instrument everything. They want to collect everything. And then next thing, you know, they have a, a series of tools that have all of this data being pumped into them, but nobody knows what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not only does nobody know what to do with it, that I mean that that really kind of is the start of your classic tech, tech debt problem, where mm -hmm. you've created so much that it, it's simply unsustainable, right? And I have mm -hmm. to imagine, I never really did get into the short. Is it on A and E? I've watched um, it uh, every now and then. I'll, I've I'll watched an episode or two, but haven't really got into it. But I have to imagine you don't go from orderly cleanliness to that overnight. I imagine it's like this process of getting there. And there's at some point in time, there's a tipping point where you've tipped so much over into like the hoarding that it's cleaning it up without just declaring bankruptcy and having the crew come in and literally strip everything out of your house is, is impossible. You can't, you, 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 can't. you can't do it. Yeah. Uh, from the episodes I've watched there, there seems to be two common threads um, for how people get to that point. It's either that they're collectors, they're collectors. So they collect tchotchkes, they, they collect things. And so they, when they get one, they have to get a whole series or, or whatever they, they collect them. So it just starts to, to build up and build up. And then eventually the collection gets away from them, whether that be in just, so much it's hard to keep everything clean or just boxes everywhere and not knowing what to do with it they're just buying it to have it not necessarily use it or the other common thread and which is not necessarily the, the the first one there i think is very relatable to our topic today the other one just to kind of finish the thought is the there's something that, that, that there's a it's something where therapy is required is needed mm -hmm. and then they have something whether it's the death of a family member or something like that just just puts them over the edge and next you know there's used pizza boxes there yeah. from six months ago on the dining room table yeah and then, i mean they do they show the the craziest of of scenarios of of people but you know this is this is a common thing and where I think where we can continue this analogy to get into our topic today. So our topic for today is the, the sustainable analytics thread, but I want to zero in on the implementation, the build, the data collection, not necessarily the usage of it. Um, but you have these folks that from the outside are doing their best to put on this appearance of, of having their life together, but you go into the house and you see that they need serious help. And it, it, it just a quick little diatribe and we'll come back. I promise. <laughs> um, this is the one thing with reality TV. Like the, these are people that really need help. These are people that really need therapy. And that's what ultimately puts them over the edge is like children, family members saying like, you seriously need help. You need like, we can't come around. We're not bringing our children around or, or whatever. So I digress. And like watching a show like that, it's not meant to laugh at people. It's like, these are people that need yeah. serious, serious help. It's not yeah. just the, the, we need to burn everything to the ground. It's you, you need a therapist, but to bring it back around to, to our scenario, 
uh, our industry, what I know you and I have seen over the years is, is something very similar. You have those digital analytics managers and, and directors that, that, that collect platforms. And it's like, if I have this platform, I need this one. I need this one. I need this one. And before you know it, they have a tech stack that has completely gotten away from them and nobody is maintaining any of it. Yeah. And I, and again, I think there are a lot of parallels to hoarding in the real world because you mentioned, you know, family members saying, Hey, we don't want to come around anymore. We can't come around. It's unclean. You, you see that in the business world, right? So you have these analytics managers that, that have this unwieldy tech stack, all this data, it's just a hoarding nightmare. The inevitable is it gets to a point where it's unsanitary and the business says, I don't want to come around your department anymore. It's, it's not clean. I, you know, I can't, I can't have my team members going in there and using your data. Like it's untrustworthy. It's just really dirty. But, but also if you, you watch some of those episodes, there, there's also a reverse of that is true where the person, although they may not be able to stop the behavior, they, they, they feel a certain level of, uh, of shame where they're embarrassed to bring people over. So they don't have guests over because they're embarrassed of, you know, it's not like they're oblivious to the state of their conditions and they're embarrassed to have guests over. And we've seen that as well, where these analytics programs have become such a, a disaster and, a, and literally a, a hoarder's house that, you know, while they can't stop the behavior, they're not unaware of the situation they create and they're embarrassed for people to come over and look at it. And, and, you know, they turn away outside help, you know, we're kind of like the interventionist, they turn away inside help, which is the family members trying to have the intervention. Um, and they don't have anyone coming over to hang out with them and, and use their, their data because they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed that the state it's in. Um, and so there's a lot of real world, um, analogies, um, and parallels there to, to what you see with physically hoarding of things. Um, and obviously I think there's probably different psychological factors at play that, that lead to that. But again, the outcomes are very, very similar. Um, and what ends up happening most of the times is that unlike, uh, owning a house that's a hoarder's nightmare, it's a lot easier to, uh, simply quit your job and move to another one to, kind of fix the situation. That's what we see happening a lot. Um, whether it's you're inheriting a, a hoarder, a hoarder's nightmare, or you've created it yourself, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, they're unwilling to accept help. Um, but then it gets to the point where it's simply unmanageable. And so they're like, you know what, I'll make it someone else's problem. I'm going to go move to a different job. Yeah. And so any kind of accountability for keeping it clean goes away. It's, it's the next person's problem, not mine. Yeah, unfortunately, that's exactly right. And I and I think, uh, honestly, that's a lot of the reason why companies get into that mess in the first place, you know, and I think it's poignant that our topic for this month is, is sustainable analytics is that they are thinking the opposite of sustainability. They're not thinking about sustainability. You know, they're not thinking about the next person that's going to take on their job. They're thinking, you know, what can I <clears throat> what can I get done today to, you know, keep so-and-so off my back or to get my bonus. I don't really you know, care what that means for the future. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let's, let, let's start from, from the beginning with this, you know, where some of these problems, the, you know, the seeds for them really start to or get planted and start to germinate. Um, in, in many organizations and throughout your career, what are some of the, early, I don't want to say signs, but some of the early actions organizations take that lead to, to digital hoarding, that lead to something that is not sustainable or easy to maintain? So I think it's twofold. It's uh, fundamentally, it's a people problem. It's hiring the wrong people. Um, and that's probably a whole other month long conversation in itself of um, businesses, uh, simply uninformed on how to hire for analytics. I mean, we've seen this throughout our careers that, um, you know, working with these companies, they simply don't have the knowledge to know how to hire a proper analytics person. Come on, dog. Um, the second one I think is, is something that is, 
more within their control. And that is a cultural issue for how they measure success. In Interesting. That, okay. Yeah. And that a lot of these organizations measure success based on the appearance of work. So, you know, if we can book more demos and buy more tools and stand up more implementations, say, hey, look what we deployed. It's like, oh, man, that guy, like he's doing some really good work. And so I think the incentive of what's being um, measured is, is wrong. Instead of looking at, you know, the output, what we're trying to do for the business, the value we're generating for the business, we're incenting people to look busy and deploy lots of stuff and collect lots of data. So our... Am I shocked that we have digital hoarders? No, because that's what, you know, they're getting, they're getting patted on the back. Oh, good job. You collected 300 new variables this month. Awesome. You're, you're up for a raise. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute. What? <laughs> but, and, and, and it may sound like I'm being facetious, but I'm not like, you know, you, I'm, you've seen it as much as I have. There are many, many organizations out here is that's how they evaluate the success of their team. And it, to you and I, and probably to a lot of our listeners, that's just like boggles the mind. They're like, really? But, oh yeah, that happens a lot. So when you combine those two things, when you combine an organization that is incenting the appearance of work over the output of the work, and then you combine that with hiring the wrong people, then it's a recipe for disaster. And, and in that scenario where both of those things are true, it's hard not to end up in this landscape of digital hoarding. Yeah. Um, I mean, we talked a bit about it last week too, around what also one of the barriers that's been removed when it comes to, when you have that kind of mindset, one of the barriers that used to be there was the cost of storage, the cost of collecting it. Storage has gotten cheaper um, with a lot of these tools. The number of custom parameters you can pass in is nearly unlimited at this point. So that was a natural barrier to that, or at least it was a deterrent um, where if, if someone had that kind of mindset, it was something they had to consider. These days they don't. And it's just easy to say, yeah, let's wire it up and, and I've said multiple times, and I will continue to admit to it, I was that implementer that was the, the person who over-engineered things. You know, I'm the one who was like, oh, this is really cool. This is a really cool thing to do without any kind of real use case on how it was going to be used because it was just cool to do. How many? It, <laughs> yeah, we, we were all there at some point in our career, yeah. right? Like the... Uh, I, I, I can think back to my first job, like, oh, man, this would be so cool to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and look, I mean, there is a time and place for that. I, I absolutely think that there's value to be had for that. But um, I think smart organizations create this concept of like uh, a lab or hacking time or, you know, just go work on what you want to work on to kind of get that out of your system and to get that fulfillment. And when they don't, you know, when they don't give that output, I mean... I, I would say, I would say the vast majority of the clients that we work with, um, specifically trying to um, undo a, a incredibly messy and non-value producing implementation, that's a big component of it, is that the implementation manager that they hire just loves to build stuff. And look, I mean, we both get it, <laughs> you know. It's fun it's, to build. It's fun. It's seductive. Um, but again, this comes goes back to my point of hiring that you know hiring the right person that has that desire which most of us do but knows how to channel it and manage it properly is so essential because again if you don't chances are you're going to get someone like oh i just want to build stuff I'm like uh-huh uh -huh, we all do but we got to take a deep breath let's slow it down let's think through what we're trying to do and then we can we can build um i think we've talked about it before People that have the that ability to slow down, it's it's, it's such a comforting thing to even watch. Um, I think Adam Savage has a whole episode out, uh, on it on his um, Untested channel on YouTube. Untested? I'm not sure. I have to look it up. Let's go look it up now. I don't. I don't want to be uh, miss quoting his uh, channel. 
untested. Tested. Why am I saying untested? Adam Savage is tested. On his tested ch YouTube channel, uh, I think he has a whole video or one of the videos he has, the majority of it is talking about this concept called nulling. Oh, where, yeah, yeah. Where it's the art of kind of organizing and laying out your workspace before you begin a project. And I think he's doing a Lego build or some kind of build and he goes through and he, you know, creates this pristine workplace and then kind of categorizes and sets everything out and just watching him do that. It's just like, oh, I can watch that all day. It's like Zen, you know? So, but, but that's what we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about laying out our, our digital projects, you know, our analytics projects is that, you know, I think Lego is a great example of it. We we've all been there. We get that new Lego set. We're so excited. We just bust it open. Just dump all the pieces on the table. Like here's eighty thousand jigsaw puzzle pieces, and and then we get frustrated over the next three hours because we can't find the part. It's like, well, we could take fifteen minutes and have a sense of calmness and sereneness about us, and simply lay it out, organize our pieces, and then build. And then it's it's such a more enjoyable process. But again, like delaying that gratification and spending that time organizing is not innate in most people. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and I'll go back to how the technology it's evolved and, and there's so much good that comes from it, but these are some of the unintended consequences because as you were talking about, like laying out all the tools you need for something, um, one of the benefits and i'll say it of having to go through your development team to to add a tag to the site was you had to lay out what are we doing what are we doing what really think through what is everything that we're collecting not just rush it out and we'll, we'll figure it out later it's what are we what what do we need to collect what are all of the use cases and then make a business case for it mm -hmm. I, I, and I get it. I've argued for tag managers and the benefits. I will say the benefits have far outweighed any kind of issues with them because you can, you can get data updated. Analytics is usually secondary when it comes to work on, on a platform developers time and, and whatnot. Um, but that being said, like one of the benefits of having to make that business case was, is you laid out everything that you need now you can go in and say, eh, for shits and giggles, <laughs> let's wire up custom dimension six and see what we collect. Yeah. And then the problem is, is then real work comes along. The, the stuff that you really need to do comes along. And then you forgot that you deployed custom dimension six. And now it's like, is this being used? Is it not like there, there yeah. nobody knows. And then you've got to maintain it in, in, in multiple ways. Yeah, and we've talked about this before that I, my belief back when we had really, really limited number of data elements that we could capture, it was actually a really good thing because mm -hmm. it, it forced us to have those difficult conversations and lay out the reasoning why we were doing it. And we made, I want to say during that time period, we made much better, more informed decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and now where they've kind of, you know, those those barriers have been removed um, I think it's a good thing that we have more freedom and flexibility, but again, the downside is, is that unless you have the self-discipline and again, this comes back to what I'm going to hamper hammer on, uh, this entire episode is this is a people issue. It's, it's ultimately not a technology issue. And yeah, we had technology controls in place that helped in the, in the decision-making process, but ultimately that, that needs to sit in the hands of people. And, and because we're hiring the wrong people and now we're um, making that issue even more explosive because the technology has allowed for those decisions to become amplified, both good and bad, we're, we're seeing the issues that, that we have. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, we have to have the self-discipline to have those same conversations we had when we only had five custom variables to now when we have 5,000 custom variables. We still need to go through that that thought process and think critically about why we're doing what we're doing and not just capture stuff to capture stuff. Um, and, and to your point around tag managers, making that easier, I will offer a word of caution that at some point in time, if you don't put that self-control on yourself, someone else will. And I've seen this in several organizations where 
the tag manager system was abused for data collection and the engineering team or the you know IT manager came in and said, okay, you guys are no longer in control. We're now the ones that are going to decide every single thing you can do in your tag manager. And it's gone full circle to a back to a point where the analytics manager now has to go and beg IT to be able to make a change in the tag manager to collect data. And the IT team may have no business doing that because they have no understanding of what's trying to be done. But the analytics manager was so reckless that there was really no other way around it. So that would be the word of caution I have for people that are going down that path, that if you can't control yourself, someone else is going to step in and do it for you. And that may not be a fun experience for you. Yeah. So what you just hit on in a couple different ways is what I see as one of the core tenets um, of, of the sustainable analytics philosophy, which is less is more. Mm -hmm. Whether it's volume of data, doing less, whatever, um, less is more, yeah. you know, like less data to maintain. Um, and, and by less, it doesn't mean deprived. It's the data that you need to make informed decisions mm -hmm. for some businesses that could mean very few custom dimensions for, depending upon the tool. Whereas another business, it could mean many, but it's, it's not, it's, not an overbearing amount. So there's that, but then also you bring up a good idea of less is more with your tag manager because mm -hmm. you're right. If you're not careful, you get on it and the system admins radars, your, your tag manager's done. You're done for, and it's yeah. going to be, a they're going to want to know every little thing that you're doing in there. You are going to be handcuffed and miserable and you're going to have to go argue in front of the Supreme court for every little change you want to make. And I guarantee you it's going to get exhausting and yeah. probably not going to last long for you. Well, cause I mean, let, let's face it. All of us who use tag managers have gotten used to the, Oh, this is just a quick fix. This is just a quick <laughs> fix. Just a quick test. I'll get it out. Nobody's going to know. And nine and a half times out of 10, nobody knows it. Right. You're fine. Right. Um, but then, yeah, you get on it's radar, you get on, the system admins radar, you're going to have to argue for every change. You're going to be putting together detailed release notes for everybody. Yeah. And because, yeah, like if you have unfettered control and well, let's just collect stuff to collect stuff. And to get into that, you know, like the, the, the issues with it, like there are two different ways you're going to get on someone's radar. Either you publish something that causes some kind of site outage they're going to notice or yeah. you do not have control of what you're doing within there you're just collecting data for data sake across multiple tools and no one's maintaining it no one's deprecating the old unnecessary data that tag manager's library is going to become bloated mm -hmm. and next thing you know someone's going to be knocking at your door saying why is this library so large and why does it contribute so much to the, the, the weight of the page and is slowing down page performance? Yeah. And, and we're, we're kind of talking about analytics, but let's also not forget that the tag manager has become kind of the de facto hot fix um, location. Yeah. And, and, Oh, we're just, it's just like, we just need it for the next 48 hours. And then three years later, the hot fix is still in there. In fact, I remember working with, with one company, and I, I don't know how much time and money they they spent unnecessarily, but they had probably hundreds of rules in their tag manager that were non-analytics, non-marketing, non-user experience related. They were literally patches to like behavior on the website that they wanted to fix. And there was a release that the dev team was trying to get out that they were just racking their brains on why it wasn't working. They were, you know... I think they had probably spent days, if not weeks, trying to debug this code before escalating it further. Come to find out there was some JavaScript or jQuery in the tag manager that was altering something on the site. Again, completely unrelated to analytics or marketing or optimization that was conflicting with this new release. And they had no idea. <laughs> you know, the dev team's like, wait a minute, where's this thing coming from? And then that's where you get this, uh oh, okay, you guys, you're not doing anything anymore without our approval on every little thing you do. So, yep. Well, it was funny. I, I can't remember who said it. I saw it on on Twitter. Um, so, unfortunately, I cannot, 
I do not remember who said it, but it was a meme or it was, it was a meme or something again, uh, but it just stuck with me. It was the, you know, someone removed a load bearing spreadsheet, <laughs> you know, how's your day going? You know, and, and it does for any of us in this space, like the images that that conjures of one little change and everything else falling on it because nobody maintains the architecture of it yeah. and what feeds what. And I think of the same thing with rules in a tag manager. Someone goes in and, hey, means well, decides, hey, these rules, they don't look like they're being used anymore. You know, they haven't been touched in four years. No one's updated them. They can't be used anymore. We could go in and start disabling things. Next thing you know, major parts of either the data collection, the marketing, the on-site advertising, all these things go down. It's a, it's a very timely conversation that you bring that up because I, I, I think a lot of businesses are facing this risk right now. Uh, with the push to GA4. So whether moving from universal to GA4, like a fundamental change, or just completely changing analytics platform, because this is causing companies to rethink their strategy, a lot of these companies, and combined with you know our desire to just build, what they're doing is they're not thinking about this interconnected ecosystem, right? It's, 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 it's like the real world where you, like, you change one little thing and it has this wide sweeping effect because all, we're all connected. These are all connected. And so you have these, these, these companies that are, you know, migrating platforms, you combine it with the wrong hires of people that just want to build, 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 build. And they don't take time to step back and even 30 minutes to step back and ask the questions, what data is coming into the current platform? What data is going out of the current platform? You know, what downstream consumers are there that are using this data or informing other systems or processes? And so they just swap swap over and then all of a sudden they've taken a bad situation and, and, and made it a hundred times worse um, because now all of a sudden they're screaming and people are freaking out. Like, oh, I didn't even think about it. Now what do we do? We shut this one off. And, you know, it's it's it just goes to talk about one, the importance of having a clean house because those decisions are a lot easier to make. And, and those projects are a lot easier to do when you're starting from a clean starting point already, which unfortunately most companies aren't. And then combined with that, taking the ability to slow down and think through the entire ecosystem and the things that, that, that have an impact. And again, having a clean house before you have those decisions makes everything so much easier. But again, I, I think most companies that ship has sailed. Most companies are already on the scale of, of hoarding, you know, mm -hmm. it's just some are completely to the point where it's unlivable and others are just getting started on that journey. But I would say by and large, most companies are somewhere on that spectrum of being, of being digital hoarders. Yeah. And so I, I want to start getting to, things around like how do you prevent this from happening what does an implementation look like through the lens of sustainable analytics but before we do you bring up a good point of companies getting to that point and you and i we were talking about this the the other day um you know just just the two of us around the idea of burn it to the ground like what does it look like when a um an organization finally gets there like trying to clean this up and it brings us back to where we started with the TV show hoarders. And, you know, they, again, they're, they're showing people with extreme cases of it and there is no, there's no going through and really picking through or trying to clean up. It's that you, you have to, in many cases, burn things to the ground. Yeah. Um, either the person's moving out because the house is being condemned and whatnot, or the, we're just emptying this house out completely and, you know, we're going to get all new stuff. What is your advice to someone who is reaching that point? Like, it's like, my God, we can't even maintain this. The thought of maintaining it is impossible. We're thinking of starting from scratch. What is your advice? What are your thoughts? And what are things that people need to think about? Because, you know, I, I bet at, at some point where it's just maintenance just seems impossible. The thought of just starting over from scratch is incredibly alluring. Mm hmm but what should you consider? I think there's probably two or three critical things that you should consider. I think these two to three things most companies don't consider. And that's why most of these projects 
um, in the long run proved to be unsuccessful and a waste of money. Uh, so those two to three things are number one, set aside a reasonable amount of time to make this happen. Um, doing rebuilds is difficult because getting the business to buy in uh, to doing something like that is is incredibly difficult. And so what happens is these analytics teams feel pressured to do it in an unreasonable time period. Oh, we're going to rebuild in three to six months. Not possible. Not possible to do it right. Um, and again, we're looking through the lens of multi-billion dollar companies. If you're a smaller company, maybe it's easier, but maybe it's harder because you don't have the resources. But number one, number one would be give yourself a proper timeline to do this. Um, otherwise, you're setting yourself up for failure right from the start. Um, number two um, would be that you need to slow down enough and talk. And we just talked about this. Number two would be slow down enough to take inventory of every system that is going to be impacted by this decision. It's not just analytics. It's not just testing. And by systems, I also mean people and processes. Who's impacted? And how are we going to manage that impact? That's number two. And then number three is one that I think um, is a really, really big challenge. And I think number three is often overlooked and is probably the biggest contributor to why these projects fail. And that is that oftentimes um, the, the ecosystem has become so damaged that burning it to the ground is not enough. And it takes considerably more work to prepare the environment to rebuild than people realize. And so they rebuild on top of toxic ground. I think you're on the opposite side of the state for this to be um, a pertinent example, but maybe you've seen it. I've definitely seen it here. We had a major steel mill in the valley that closed down and it was a super fun site. It was toxic um, and they ripped it down. And now it's houses and retail space. What would have happened if they just ripped it down, took away the building materials, and then build new houses and new new structures? Well, potentially physical damage to the houses mm -hmm. because you don't know how stable the land is just physically. But the bigger problem <laughs> is the health of the people living. That's there. right. Yeah, and, and that's that's the bigger issue. Yeah, and the, and and really, this is a, a a huge problem for these type of projects. Is they they often are these super fun sites that tearing down the uh, existing structure and rebuilding a new structure is is not good enough and they build a beautiful structure that within 12 to 18 months is starting to fall apart again and the and the team is sick because everything underneath it the 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 ground that they built these things on was toxic and and that toxic ground is a lot of the questions that don't get answered wait a minute how did we get here in the first place do we have the right people do we have the right processes a lot of times that ground stays toxic because they don't remove all the, the bad soil. And by that, I mean, there's this argument of, oh, we just need to keep this one rule or we just need to keep this one part of the data layer. That's kin to, akin to like leaving a bunch of toxic soil around after you tore the building down and putting a house on top of it. It yeah. is not going to end well. Yeah, uh, that then that that's exactly what I, I think of with it is where I've seen these kinds of projects fail. Where I mean, and they fail right out of the gate the minute people start saying, This piece of logic we need to port over, mm -hmm. or we need to make sure we preserve this or this. Well, then you're not burnt, you're not actually burning it to the ground, you're bringing over something that came that, that was part of a problematic environment. You're bringing that over, and the minute you open the door for just this one or just these two you end up keeping half of the diseased ecosystem in place. And now it's just got a shiny coat of paint over top of it. Mm -hmm. That paint's going to wear away. Yeah. And taking a full circle back to how we started this conversation, it's, it's, it's not only removing the, the toxic in, uh, components of your existing environment, it's also removing the behavior. And if you think back to some of the episodes of hoarders that you've watched, They've done that, right? Like they bring like, the therapist. I, I just want to keep these three things. No, we can't keep these things. Like literally, this is a doll covered in cat feces 
we can't keep this. No, I just need to keep this one thing. It's like, but if you allow them to keep it, it, that mindset of being able to keep all this stuff that is, is not good for them perpetrates the reason why they got here in the first place. So you're going to have a clean house that six months from now is going to look like it did yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause you're not getting, getting to, to the root of the problem. Yeah. Um, so as, as we start to bring this one home, um, you know, we, we've talked about the issues. Um, we've, we've talked about the causes of, of those issues that are what, what people experience from the lens of sustainable analytics. What does a analytics implementation, a MarTech, um, an analytics tech stack look like, um, from, from the implementation and data collection perspective? Well, organized, clean, less is more. So we're going to have less stuff, but the things we have are going to be uh, of incredibly high quality and incredibly value producing, um, well-structured and well-documented, you know, all these things that take time to slow down and do right are indicative of implementations that have all the hallmarks of being sustainable. Um, and, and are the exact opposite of kind of this persona that we talked about of, we just need to build and build and build now, like more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. So if you think about it and you think, you know, I'm having a hard time answering the question of what does sustainable look like? All you have to do is look at an implementation that is, is, is unsustainable, which is a hoarder's, you know, nightmare. And just think about the opposite of that. And it's a, probably a good, um, way of identifying what a sustainable, practice would, would, would look like. Um, so, I mean, that, that's from like a, a results perspective. I'm going to come back to the fact that oftentimes, you know, the technology or, or how the technology is designed, um, is often really not the issue. The issue most of the times is a people and process issue. So, um, unless you address those things, then, you know, even having someone, and again, like these hoarders, they bring in ex, uh, experts from outside, right? And therapists, and they get it all cleaned up. But in, unless you address the people issue, why it got that play, way in the first place, it's going to go right, right back to that. So really sustainability is, yeah, I mean, yes, we need to have a clean environment to start with or to, to work with. But unless we address the people and process issues that got us there in the first place, it's, it's never going to be sustainable. And so I would, I would argue that organizations need to start there instead of saying, you know, what does the ideal data layer look like? Or what does the ideal setup in our tag manager look like? Or what is the right analytics platform for us to use? Those are secondary questions. The first questions you should be answering is number one, people. Do we have the right people, both internal employees and external experts? Um, and then number two, do we have the right processes internally and vision and leadership in place to, to make this happen? And, and that's where most organizations fail. And again, it comes down to people. They don't have the right people in the positions. The people they do have in the positions lack the vision, uh, lack the backbone to have a, a strong stance and stand behind why they're doing what they're doing. And so these organizations throw lots and lots of money at constantly cleaning up the mess I mean, we've been in these implementation cycles for 20 years. They're throwing lots of money at cleaning up the mess, and it might be clean for a few months or even a year or so, but they're not addressing the underlying reasons why it got there. And so, well, we're right back to where we began with, right? But the team doesn't care because they've quit and moved on. It's someone else's problem now. So at some point in time, someone has to care. And at some point in time, this responsibility needs to sit with someone high enough in the organization that has the the ability to to see it through and commit to something uh, long term, and for most companies that simply is non-existent. Yeah, I've got nothing to add to that. <laughs> Like I, I, it was like, I'm trying to think of a follow up question, but they all come back to, to the same thing. Well, we shouldn't force it then. Yeah. So no, I, I think that, yeah, I think that leads to, to a good place to, to wrap up. And I think it just, it ultimately comes back to what we talked about last week as well, or no, it was two weeks ago. It's 
these the roots of these are are people mm -hmm. organizational it's not the tools it's not it's not and it's it's the it's the it's seemingly the easy fix um it's much easier to blame the tools than to blame your team <laughs> And so, you know, we, we see this happening time again. Ah, if only we implement this tool, it solves all our problems. I've never once in 20 years seen it solve all the problems. No, it, it's just, it, it, it's one more thing. It's, it's a band aid. Yeah. Um, it's, I was listening to something the, the other day and, you know, they were talking about the joy in the pursuit. Mm. And this kind of talks about like the joy in, in building that we see when it comes to analytics implementations, it's the joy in building it. It's not the joy in using it. Um, and like in this case, it's the, you know, like it's the joy in getting something. And then once you get it, it's like, Oh, okay. Move on to, to the next thing. It, it, it's the same thing. Like where if you're not careful, you're just constantly searching for the next thing, whether it's the next piece of data to build the next tool to implement, mm -hmm um and nobody cares after it's in place and and here's the secret if you find joy in the maintenance it actually makes joy in using the product that much but that much better and and, and people don't want to hear it but it's absolutely true one of my one of my favorite things to cook in is my cast iron skillet i get so much joy out of maintaining that thing <laughs> like you know cleaning it and re-seasoning it and making sure it's just perfect that when i use it it is in such a nice place that it is an absolute joy to use mm -hmm. the opposite holds true like if you don't enjoy maintaining your cast iron and then you go to use it and it's like an absolute mess and everything's sticking to it and it's rusted then the experience of using it is going to be horrible so you know to those people it's like ah, i hate maintenance it's like but if you can figure out how to love the maintenance, it makes the usage of that thing you're maintaining so much. You'll get more joy out of it than you've ever had before. I, I guarantee it. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that that is a great place to to, to wrap up. Awesome. This is a good conversation. Yeah, yeah it is. It, it's good. I think it's it's timely. Um, and yeah, like that's I, I do. I, I think about it all the time where. Yeah, you have these organizations that get to this place where it's unsustainable anymore. They forget how long it took to get to that spot, but they also forgot forget how long it took to get to the good portions of what they have. Yeah. And yes, then it turns into the let's rip everything down and try to get everything back up in six months, not realizing that it took you six years to get there. Yeah. 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 Give yourself the, the proper time period. It's hard, yeah. but it's, it's a necessity. Yeah. Cool. Well, we will go ahead and wrap up there and talk to everyone later. See you. See you.